Okay, just before starting off, uh, I would just like to know uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with microcontrollers or microprocessors? Okay, um, that's good enough. Uh, we'll just see, uh, uh, as you know that microprocessors and microcontrollers are there in almost everything that we use uh, in day-to-day -day life, from our normal cell phones to even cars, uh, digital cameras, uh, many lifestyle products basically. Okay, uh, so these are not only used for uh, say consumer products, but also in industrial automation, etc, etc. Okay, uh, so what you would have here is a basic introduction to microcontrollers and microprocessors, what they are, how do they function, and some more than in-depth uh, sort of an analysis into the 8051. Uh, 8051 is a microcontroller which was uh, say around uh, 30 years back, it was uh, invented by the Intel company and it is still used in commercial purposes today also. It, you could say that it is the mother of all microcontrollers. Uh, this is a basic, if we see how the uh, processing family is divided. There are microprocessors, there are microcontrollers, then we have PLDs and FPGAs. Okay, uh, in micro uh, microprocessors, uh, we use in our day-to-day -day lives, in our PCs, etc. Uh, they are available in different bit varieties, like 32-bit, 64-bit, etc. Uh, the easiest example of a 32-bit would be your Intel processor. Intel Pentium processors and we do have dual core processors, core 2 duo processors that are the latest uh, in the Intel family. They are also 32 bit but they have two cores. So they can effectively say act as a 64 bit processor. Okay, And you have the Athlon series of processors by the rival company AMD uh, that is generally a 64 bit processor, Athlon XP 64 bit they uh, market it as a 64 bit processor. Okay, Then for high end servers also Intel produces Xeon which is a, again a 64-bit processor. What do you mean by this uh, bits? I say 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit. Everyone is uh, aware of uh, numbers, right? Uh, bits and bytes and megabytes, kilobytes, etc. Okay, computer basically understands only the language of ones and zeros. At the very, very basic level, all the digital electronics that today works, they are at one and zeros. Okay, that's the language they understand. Okay, so each, uh, uh, a bit is a simplest type of data. It can ha either have two states, either a 1 or a 0. It's not like a decimal number system 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but it just has two states, either a 1 or a 0. That is the most basic representation of data that we can have today. Okay. Uh, so, when we say uh, that it has a 16, it's a 16 bit processor or a 32 bit processor or a 64 bit processor, what we exactly mean is, at a particular point of time, it can process these many bits of information. Okay, say we are in one instruction, it can process 32 bits of instruction or say 64 bits of instruction. So uh, you can almost directly equate it like the more the number of bits, okay, the faster your processor is. So it's almost like a 64 bit would be doubly faster than the 32 bit processor. But uh, you can't exactly say it would be double, but it would increase proportionally. Okay, because there are various other factors also coming into the picture. Uh, then we have the microcontrollers. Uh, there is a uh, difference between microprocessors and microcontrollers. Uh, they are not the one and the same thing. People do tend to use the same two words uh, interchangeably, but it's not so. Okay, uh, microprocessors generally you would say are just processing units. Okay, the ones that we use. Because, uh, and microcontrollers have uh, other features also built into them. They are not just processing units, but they have various features built into them. Uh, it, would, um, uh, it could be explained something like microprocessors. Uh, uh, you have your PC, okay, in that there is a microprocessor, there is a serial port, a parallel port, uh, various different PCI expansion cards, RAM, uh, your hard disk is your main memory. Okay, where all the data is stored, non-volatile memory, even if you switch off, the data is still retained. Okay, all these things are, they form your entire CPU, right? It's a big unit. But a microcontroller, you can consider it as a, a complete CPU on a single chip. Okay, because microcontrollers have their own uh, processing unit, that is the ALU, arithmetic logic unit. Uh, it has its own memory where you can store your programs that you could say equate it to your hard disk. Okay. Uh, then it has its own RAM and it has various other peripherals like a serial port, uh, parallel outputs, inputs and outputs, uh, timers, counters, interrupts, which we shall see uh, in depth later on. Okay. Uh, any questions in between, uh, just uh, let me know. 
uh, because uh, the more we are clear with this part, the more it would help us with the hands-on sessions that would be occurring later on. Okay. Uh, so we are clear with the basic what a microcontroller is, right? Okay. Um, so we have uh, the microcontrollers. Uh, in microcontrollers, also we have uh, various bits. Okay, starting from 8-bit to the 32-bit microcontrollers. Okay. Uh, in 8-bit, we have 8051, uh, we have AVR series, we have microchips PIC series. Okay, these are some of the more famous uh, series. Then there is always uh, also uh, companies like Zilog, Hitachi, Renesas, etc. manufacturing their own range of microcontrollers. Okay, in the 16-bit, uh, the famous ones are Texas MSP430. It is a very new entrant into the market, but it is quite famous and it is quite catching up with the latest trends. Uh, it's a very low power consumption microcontroller also. Uh, there is Motorola's microcontroller, there is Intel's 80196, etc. Okay. And in the 32-bit, uh, generally the leader in 32-bit is the ARM microcontrollers. Uh, you might have heard of ARM microcontrollers. They are uh, used in your cell phones, like my cell phone here also has an ARM microcontroller in it. Basically, this company ARM, okay, they don't actually manufacture microcontrollers, but they what they actually do is they manufacture the cores. Okay, how exactly the microcontroller should function. Okay, the basic intellectual property is developed by them and then they give this uh, uh, rights to different manufacturers, the actual chip manufacturers who, you know, buy this uh, cores from them and manufacture their own chips. Like Intel themselves also manufacture ARM cores, uh, ARM core based microprocessors, microcontrollers. Uh, Intel's X scale series of microcontrollers, uh, I think they are used in PlayStation, the uh, remotely, um, the handheld gaming uh, devices that children usually play with. Okay, uh, so well, uh, so we, in microcontrollers also we have a wide variety ranging from the 8-bit to the 32-bit. 8-bit processors are uh, generally microcontrollers generally are used when they are supposed to do only say a specific task. I program the microcontroller to do a specific task, and then it goes on doing that task. Say for a vending machine, a chocolate vending machine uh, or at the airport you might see or a coke vending machine. They have a microcontroller inside them and it's specified and designed to do only one task. You put in a coin, you get a Pepsi or a coke, whatever outside. Okay. So uh, the, uh, as microcontrollers in your car, okay, the one which uh, takes care of the cooling etc. It adjusts to the outside, checks the temperature outside, okay, adjusts uh, the uh, AC, uh, the air inflow to the ACs etc. And controls the temperature. Basically, they are designed to do only a specific set of tasks. So, we uh, for lower end control systems, we can have 8-bit microcontrollers. 16-bit slightly for higher end and as we said, for uh, things like cell phones, uh, portable gaming uh, stations, your iPods, the latest uh, iPhone, uh, the hyped iPhone, uh, that also has an ARM processor inside it. Uh, it's, I think, manufactured by Samsung or something but it also has a ARM core. Okay. So, for these high end application, we can use microcontrollers because and 32 bit microcontrollers because they need a, uh, they need to process lots of info like your cell phone needs to display a colors, uh, color, uh, color screen, it needs to let you play games, uh, con connect to Bluetooth, lots of other uh, peripheral activities also it has to control at a uh, simultaneously. Okay. Uh, then there are PLDs and FPGAs. Uh, they are, uh, you could say, PLDs are programmable logic devices, and FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays. Uh, what they are used, field FPGA in specific, uh, they are uh, used for setting up a uh, particular task chip. Okay. Say, whenever I say I want to make a new, develop a new microcontroller, say. Okay. So, what I do is everything today is actually modeled upon the hardware that we want. So, I want to design a microcontroller with X number of features. I would model all the features on a software. Like whenever we do an analysis, we generally uh, model, uh, make a mathematical model of those. In this, we make a computer uh, hardware description language, we call it HDL. Okay, we make a hardware description language, say whenever I get this input at this particular place or at this particular time, the microcontroller is supposed to do this. Such a complete flowchart, a list of whatever the microcontroller can do is written in a hardware description language is fed into a FPGA. Okay, so the FPGA then acts as a microcontroller. Okay, so it is used for prototyping purposes, for research purposes and also for a variety of other reasons. Okay, uh, 
so these are basically the type of controls that we have uh, based on digital controls okay and there are other features also built into microcontrollers like adcs uh, analog to digital converter because in the real world the actual signals they are all analog they are not digital uh, my pressure sensor won't tell me that the pressure is high or low it won't say 1 or 0 it will basically say it is uh, uh, say 16 kilopascals 1 kilopascal or whatever okay something like that it would be a analog value it never it will never be a digital value so to convert that into digital form i would need a adc analog to digital converter that is also one specific feature of some microcontrollers like i said yeah uh, yeah uh, nice for pointing it out uh, basically they can be divided into cisc and risc uh, cisc means complex instruction set computing and risc means reduced instruction set computing okay mm. well, the difference between the, uh, those is uh, in a complex instruction set computing you have lots of instructions okay uh, say if i want to multiply two numbers in a cisc cisc based microcontroller what i would do is i would say mul say just uh, take it as an instruction mul a and b okay so it would multiply the two numbers say 2 into 7 so it would multiply 2 into 7 directly but in a risc machine i won't have many number of instructions the instruction set is reduced okay so i say uh, in a cisc if i have say 1 and 100 instructions i might have just 25 or 35 in a risc machine so when i want to multiply two numbers what i would be doing is i would be adding it so many times say 2 into 7 so i would be adding 2 to itself seven times okay now the uh, uh, advantage is that these risc machines have independent lanes as in say if i want to add it is directly hard uh, added by a hardware inside the microcontroller okay the alu has independent uh, channels for separate instructions so the execution is faster in risc yeah uh, say uh, there is a add instruction okay uh, i want to my basic aim is to multiply 2 into 7 okay so in a uh, risc uh, sorry cisc what it would do is it has an instruction say multiply but internally what it does is it stores uh, 2 and 7 okay and it adds 2 to 7 uh, uh, 2 to itself 7 times but it has to automatically say uh, the alu has to know that okay uh, one it has added it has become four at the next time okay it has to control both the things but in a uh, in a risk what you need to do is you need to say uh, uh, specify seven um, instructions say add two to two add two to two again seven times okay so what this would happen to do is it has independent lanes independent uh, hardware uh, entities for carrying out add subtract and certain other functions okay so since it's a hardware job it would be done much faster and there is another concept in this that is called as pipelining so basic uh, whenever you need to uh, uh, execute an instruction the basic uh, fundamental is you have to fetch the instruction from the memory decode the instruction first as in what the instruction is saying what it what has to be done and then execute it so in pipelining what happens is when i have executing one instruction the other instruction has already been fetched and decoded okay so basically i am you could say it's a parallel processing kind of a thing at a very basic level okay so that also makes it a much faster process yeah. r stands from reduced reduced yeah uh, nowadays there is another concept also called as zisc that is zero instruction set computing okay uh, that basically uh, is uh, based upon more of um, comparison based systems as in you need to teach the system the inputs and accordingly it will give the output okay say i have a zisc machine with 35 instructions so uh, you can um, say i want to make a um, color recognizer with a zisc machine okay so what I will do is I will say hold a red color in my hand the camera proceeds it and some processing goes on and the final output should be given as I would say one okay I will have to teach I can teach 35 instructions like that to a ZISC machine say for the green I would say two the output will be two 
the gray it would be say 5 something like that. So, it is a very fast machine because it is a one to one correspondence between the input and the output ok, but there are obvious limitations ok as the number of uh, say uh, things that can be compared or something like that and it is still in development means it is not completely used everywhere also, but it is a still ongoing process. Uh, DSPs are uh, uh, digital signal processors, okay. uh, they have specialized units as I said in RISC there are specialized units for add etc. In this there are specified units for say making a Fourier, uh, getting a Fourier transform or getting a Laplace transform something like that more related to the signal processing field. They are faster than those ways. I would not be using a DSP for normal uh, day to day uh, say like a vending machine application, but I would be using it for data acquisition cards. PC based CROs etcetera etcetera ok. Uh, these are some various vendors uh, manufacturers that uh, there are in today's market uh, Atmel, Freescale, Hitachi, um, uh, Intel lots of them and they have their own range of microcontrollers also and as uh, similar to ARM there are 8051 cores ok that are manufactured by various manufacturers. 8051 not only is manufactured by Intel, but it is manufactured by Philips, uh, analog devices, I think Maxim Dallas also manufactures them, Atmel manufactures them, many other manufacturers also manufacture them. We will be using for our sessions a Philips microcontroller which is called the 89V51 RD2. Uh, 89V51 RD2 basically we will, uh, we are using because uh, one it is very closely related to the academics of today ok, because and uh, second it is a it has a long legacy it has been around for uh, past 20-25 years ok. So, there is lot of literature available on it good books literature on the net many projects etcetera etcetera uh, lot of support available on it uh, it is in spite it, it being so old it is still a uh, an industry you could say a standard because many industries still use them for their control applications. Uh, then uh, it is uh, very easy to use very good for the beginner as a beginners level microcontroller very simple to understand and easy to use ok. So, we will be using uh, the, uh, an 8051 core based processor the Philips P89V51 RD2 for our use ok. Uh, we that is just a numbering sequence that they have uh, there are LV 51 RD 2 there are C 51 RD 2 that is by the manufacturer itself. Is it uh, something related to the memory I mean a CMOS or something like that? Uh, I am not that sure of no, but it has flash memory and that is another feature that makes it a very attractive choice for us the inbuilt bootloader ok. Uh, there is a basic architecture of the 8051 ok. Mm, what we have on the top is a CPU ok the ALU basically that does all the instruction uh, crunching etc in the instruction come what is supposed to be done that is the main central controller ok. Then we have four IO ports IO means input output ports uh, port 0, 1, 2 and 3 uh, and there is just a convention that whenever we are in the digital world we are speaking about digital electronics we generally start the numbering from 0 ok, it will always 0, 1, 2, 3, it will not be 1, 2, 3, 4 ok. So, we have 4 ports here, zero, uh, port 0, 1, 2 and 3 uh, all are 8 bit ports ok. So, uh, I have basically 32 IO lines ok, I can connect say up to 32 single bit devices with this or, or I can connect say 4 8 bit devices ok. Uh, then there is 64 KB of flash ok. This flash memory is a non volatile memory ok. So, when even if you switch off your uh, controller the contents of the flash is still intact ok. So, that we will be using for storing our code where the main program the main programs that we will be writing will be stored in the flash memory ok. Then we have a RAM uh, why is RAM used for generally it is used for uh, uh, storing variables, data etcetera etcetera ok and it is a volatile memory 
volatile by volatile mean, uh, means when we switch off the contents are lost ok uh, nowadays as you know PCs are say um, uh, 512 MB RAM has become a standard nowadays 1 GB also easily uh, many PCs do have even in institutes etc but here if you see a microcontroller the uh, flash that is the ROM is only 64 KB but whereas in our uh, PCs today we have 40 GB, 80 GB etc ok that is because obviously the task to be done by a microcontroller is of far less magnitude we don't need a microcontroller to play mp3s ok the 8051 you didn't play mp3s or say play movies or do matlab or autocad or any such thing so it doesn't need that kind of a memory it doesn't need much of a ram also because it doesn't uh, need to access so many variables or uh, uh, um, calculate on so many variables at a given point of time so 1 kb of ram and 64 kb of flash are more or less sufficient for our use ok uh, then we have uh, different peripherals uh, they are timers, counters there is a UART there is an SPI ok uh, there is a crystal uh, oscillator unit uh, the oscillator unit uh, is a uh, you could say a reference unit on which the microcontroller runs ok our microcontroller board will be running at 11.0592 megahertz Okay, uh, uh, this uh, you must have heard uh, Intel processors running at 3.4 gigahertz. You know they pry, uh, they have uh, proud themselves feeling that okay we have created a processor running at this gigahertz or something like that. Okay, basically there is a reference clock that means uh, at each uh, clock cycle it will execute one instruction. Okay, it's basically an inst uh, reference to run itself, the uh, crystal oscillator. Okay, so we will be running at 11.0592 megahertz why a, such a peculiar number also we will come to know later mm. then we have a UART uh, UART basically is a, uh, a unit to convert your data to serial communication ok to serial data or parallel data to serial data this is just a basic introduction we will be covering all the sections in much detail later on ok yeah Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can have a robot which can solve a maze using this also. Basically, now we are not concerned with what we are gonna build. We are concerned. Yes. Why? Not all autonomous robots need to be uh, have a that level of uh, say c control or uh, computation. Okay, we can build uh, and even a, f a robot which follows a line is an autonomous robot, or a robot which uh, say uh, avoids an obstacle is an autonomous robot, or a robot which solves a maze is an autonomous robot. Okay, uh, and obviously NASA's uh, Mars rover that is an autonomous robot so basically we have different levels obviously I can't have a mass rover with an 8051 that, that is a given autonomous. autonomous is something the, that can take inputs from the surroundings and act accordingly but can I say that sorry I, I didn't get you Yeah, yeah. Nee, autonomous means uh, control automatically, okay. And the level of control can vary. Ha, the level of control can vary. This would be quite a, you could say, uh, a basic level that we would be covering, uh, basic to an intermediate level that we would be covering during the workshop. And using the 8051, obviously, you could go on to a higher level of control also. Uh, so, we have various other peripherals also, uh, like SPI, that is also another serial protocol. Okay, for uh, uh, sending transferring data in serial, it is, gen it is generally used for communication between two microcontrollers, the SPI interface. Okay, then we have timer counters, uh, we have the PCA that we will be coming to later. Uh, so, basically, uh, the main components you could say are the CPU, uh, the uh, flash, the RAM, the ports, and the peripheral devices that are inbuilt ok 
like uh, if just uh, taking going back to the PC again that we have in this a UART is built in in your motherboard if you see serial port uh, near the serial port you might see a small chip called 8250 okay that is basically the serial port controller in your motherboard okay so the processor does it have it doesn't have it built in but it is a separate IC on the motherboard okay uh, this is somewhat like a very very basic minimum minimalistic circuit that is required to get the 8051 up and running okay uh, you can see here some uh, capacitors a crystal okay and a register okay uh, the crystal is connected between two pins xtal1 and xtal2 that are the crystal pins uh, then at the rst pin you will see a register capacitor arrangement okay uh, that is there specifically so that uh, even when you switch the microcontroller on uh, it directly doesn't start executing okay you might see that uh, when the uh, power is first switched on what happens is the capacitor is shorted okay when you directly switch on okay so the capacitor is in a state of short okay so uh, uh, continuous high voltages on the RST pin that is the reset pin okay so when the capacitor starts charging at that time okay when the capacitor is fully charged what happens is acts as an open circuit a fully charged capacitor acts as an open circuit okay at that time if you see the RST pin is grounded okay so till the charging time of the capacitor the uh, microcontroller is in a state of reset okay why this is done is because uh, directly when we switch on the oscillator can't begin to oscillate at such a high frequency okay it takes some time to it to you know stabilize the oscillations okay and if, if in that period if you start the microcontroller and it starts running uh, the programs there might be some errors because the reference itself is not correct okay so that's why we have we keep the microcontroller in a reset state for some part of time and then we start the execution okay all these values of capacitors resistors etc everything we get on the, in the data sheet they have specified that for a minimum uh, 1 millisecond it should be kept on the reset state okay so according to that the values have been calculated so there is a you could say a basic circuit that you would need to get an 8051 up and running okay uh, these are some of the limitations that we have for the 8051 there is no analog to digital converter built in okay uh, there is no I square C that is also a serial protocol uh, quite widely used today uh, there is a very limited amount of PWM uh, PWM is pulse width modulation uh, that is also used for a lot of control applications uh, say a very basic example could be controlling a speed of a motor okay depending upon the duty cycle of the wave say if I have a hundred percent duty cycle wave what is it it is a DC level right say I am having a 5 volt motor okay and I am giving a 5 volt DC to it it runs at maximum speed but suppose I give a square wave that is at 50 percent duty cycle so the average value of the uh, signal that is applied would be 2.5 volts so the speed would be reduced okay so this is the application uh, one of the applications of PWM we have a certain limited amount of PWM in the 8051 okay um, basically just a end of the topic uh, small introductory session uh, anything regards to this if you have any queries uh, you can ask now or else uh, move on regarding the 8051 basic 8051 basic microcontrollers and microprocessors in general if you say fine with this Yeah, it can be. No, no. Microcontroller is available. You have to program it for different applications. Oh, so the chip is same. Yeah. You have to program it according to our yes. So I can use the same ARM processor for say having an MP3 player or as a cell phone. Because in nowadays, if you see the cell phones, it has an MP3 player. It has a camera. It has. It makes calls, obviously, and lots of other things also. Uh, we'll just go into some more details of the 8051 as a microcontroller. You know that we have chosen the 8051 and why we have chosen the 8051. Okay. Uh, so this was just a recap as in what we had seen, the basic block diagram of the 8051. 
uh, we'll go into the individual functional parts in slightly more detail now. Uh, this would be something your pin configuration would look like. This is your 40 pin IC uh, and these are the different uh, ports and the pins that are there. There are four ports as you see, 0, 1, 2 and 3. Uh, there are various other pins also. Uh, you could see that uh, in a single pin itself you have, you can see two functions. Say if you see P0.0 slash AD0 or something like that. Isn't it? In P3 underscore 0, it's also RxD. Isn't it? That is called something as pin multiplexing. Okay. Well, basically, we are giving two functions to a single pin. And why we are doing that is, obviously, uh, ICs are uh, uh, expensive to manufacture in the first stage. Okay. The more the silicon you use, the size of the IC becomes more. And there are different factors coming into consideration like heat dissipation, etc etc okay so for that we need to keep it compact and if say i had individual pins for each of this i would have around a 75 pin microcontroller so it is much difficult to you know actually manufacture the device manufacture devices based on that okay so basically i would be using one pin for two functions okay this is just an example as the p3 it's highly multiplexed there are different things like RxD, TxD. I can just tell you that it's a, it's for the serial port, the UART. Okay, receive and transmit. There are different T1, T0, INT0, INT1, RD, WR. We'll come to what their functions are in a while. Okay, an I/O port. What is basically an I/O port? Uh, in uh, microcontrollers, there are things called as registers. Okay, what these registers basically are? They are pieces of memory. Okay not in the flash or the ramp, but an uh, independent place in the microcontroller itself. Okay. So port also, you could consider it as a specific register, say P0 register, that is a port 0 register. Okay. So whenever I write, uh, everyone is uh, familiar or say uh, accustomed to binary to hexadecimal conversions, binary to, uh, uh, we have just given you a handout, you could brush up and we don't need it right now, but we would be needing it in the programming section. Okay, you would just uh, go through it and you would uh, get to know how to convert binary to hexadecimal, except binary to decimal, etc. etc. Okay, so basically, binary is the uh, basic machine language. So, whenever I say if I write all ones to it, okay, say I write all ones to the port, that is, I am writing all ones to the port 0 register. Okay, and I am writing one means I am writing a you could say uh, uh, 5 volts basically, high means 1 means 5 volts and 0 means 0 volts. Okay. So whenever I check using a multimeter, if I check uh, how much the voltage is at there on the port 0 pin, okay, I would get 5 volts if I have written P0 equal to high. Okay. So basically ports we will use to interface various devices. Okay. For in interface any device, obviously you need a uh, uh, path from which you can access the device. Okay, that is your the, that path is your port. Okay, we will be uh, interfacing things like uh, LCD. Okay, which is an output device on which you can see things even on uh, uh, displayed on the LCD. Uh, we will interface LEDs. We will interface switches. Switches are an input device. Okay, uh, we will in, uh, interface a buzzer. We will interface motor drivers. Uh, we have already interfaced, uh, we will be interfacing the serial port, etc, etc. Okay. So, port basically uh, you can say is a connection to the other devices around the microcontroller. Okay. As in my, uh, 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 in a cell phone, again if I take an example of a cell phone, uh, the, uh, I have to interface the keypad. Okay. That is your input. Okay. That would be done through one port. The LCD of the cell phone would have to be interfaced that would be using something else. Say a Bluetooth might not be directly on the microcontroller itself, but it might be a separate module that is attached. Okay, that also I need to interface with the main microcontroller. Okay, so similar things I can interface using ports. So these are some kind of a some kind of devices, sensors, etc. That you can interface with the port. Uh, UART. Mm. Basically, uh, the data transfer can be divided into basic two types. Okay. 
you can say a parallel data transmission and serial data transmission okay now what are the pluses and minuses of either okay parallel obviously you are uh, say if it's a 8 bit data bus okay we will say one byte we are sending at one time so we have if i want to uh, transmit a data in parallel how many wires would i need eight. 8 okay but if i want to do that in a serial two. i would need two if i want to receive and transmit or if i just want to transmit i would just need one okay so uh, uh, basically what i am doing here is i am saving on number of lines but i am sacrificing slightly on the speed because parallel i can transmit one byte at once but in serial i will be uh, if i want to transmit a byte i would have to transmit bit by bit okay i will send the one bit then the next bit and after say eight cycles the complete byte will be transferred okay so in effect i am going for slightly lower speed but i am saving on costs if i have to tra transfer data say 1 kilometer across okay a serial uh, link would provide a much better interface than a parallel link because if i want to lay 8 kilometers of cable that is 8 wires the cost would almost increase 8 times right so i am saving on the cost all of major uh, uh, data transfer today is in serial your LAN cables, uh, I square C serial, RS485 is a standard used in many industries for uh, then there is SCAN controller automation uh, automate, automotive network ok. Uh, there are many uh, protocols today which all have serial and wireless data ok that is serial ok. Uh, otherwise if I had to send wireless data parallelly I would need say 8 different frequencies to send it ok and that would be quite a, a diff uh, difficult task to do and it would be uh, you would uh, it would be difficult to design a receiver and a transmitter for the same ok. So basically I will use serial transmission here ok. So what the UART basically does is ok. So it takes the data all the data being uh, uh, transmitted inside the microcontroller is in parallel because the distances are short and I need high speeds ok. Say data between the UART and the CPU or between one register and the CPU ok all is in parallel ok but when I want to transfer it to somewhere outside say I will use this serial uh, interface that is a UART. So what the UART block does is it takes the data in parallel ok say it adds a start and a stop bit and then sends it. UART here stands for universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. The word asynchronous here is a, of a bit special, uh, special importance ok. Uh, our controller is running at a particular speed ok and if my receiver is not running at the same speed will I be able to receive it properly? No because there would be some uh, error because uh, say I would send it and it would say not receive the first byte but it would receive the second third fourth till the seventh byte uh, seventh bit ok. So that can be a problem. So here the asynchronous word comes in ok and I also have synchronous protocols in which I have a dedicated clock line ok. The clock from my CPU goes to the receiver also ok. So there the data is synchronized here it is asynchronous. So what I need to do is I need to add a start and a stop bit ok. It is something like uh, we have all seen in movies in army movies especially when uh, the uh, person in field calls the base uh, alpha come in alpha come in that is some sort you, you would say a start bit. Okay, it is indicating that I am going to send some transmission, send some valid data. Okay, then after the start bit, a data packet would be there. Okay, and then it would be there will be a stop bit, something like the over and out signal that a army man gives to the base over and out. Okay, there is a stop bit. My data transmission has ended. Okay, so basically in this uh, kind of uh, protocol, you don't need a other dedicated clock line. So that is one of the advantages ok. So we are using for UART for these purposes. There are different uh, here comes the 11.0592 megahertz ok the crystal that we will be using. Uh, basically it is a weird number 11.0592 megahertz it is used because there are standard baud rate set today. Baud rate is the uh, how in what speed I would be sending the data ok it is uh, like 400 bits per second, 9600 bits per second, 4800 bps something that you might have heard in the olden day modems 
33.6 kbps modem it was 56.6 kbps modem okay those are all standard baud rates that was standardized by ibm okay still now those are in uh, those are a standard platform so this 11.0592 megahertz can ac accurately generate any of these baud rates okay when say i go in for 12 megahertz crystal it won't generate the exact baud rate but it would generate Uh, there will be slightly uh, say one or two percent error while generating the baud rate, but this 11.0592 megahertz would generate all the baud rates perfectly. Okay, so I'll be using this crystal. Clear with this? The serial communication part. Okay. Uh, we'll come to UART. Uh, sorry, interrupts. Okay, uh, these are one of uh, a very important feature of today's microcontrollers, microprocessors, etc. uh things run on them basically uh interrupts as you can see uh, they can occur any time okay and they are higher priority than the operation that is being currently performed okay uh example of an interrupt uh can be your control alt del on your pc anything you are doing if you press the control alt del it shows you a task manager or whatever on windows okay your reset button that is also an interrupt okay so uh, it is uh, what exactly happens is it is something like your programming is being executed okay uh suddenly an interrupt comes okay what the cpu does is it does not just go to the interrupt or jump but it uh, stores specific data related to that program in a particular space goes to the interrupt does some work regarding the interrupt and comes back to the same space where it was executing it can be something like you are reading a book okay uh, a phone call comes a very important phone call say from a uh, boss or something a phone call comes and you need to attend it what you do is you place a bookmark in the book close it attend the phone call come back okay we'll go back to where the bookmark was placed and start reading from there so here your normal execution was your reading of the book okay the interrupt was the phone call uh talking over the phone was what you did when the interrupt occurred that thing is called as isr interrupt service routine okay a specific set of functions that you do when an interrupt is called okay now storing the bookmark okay that was a very important aspect here okay because when it comes after the interrupt it should know what it was executing previously right otherwise it would start executing something else so what it does is the cpu it stores some specific data as in what instruction it was executing what data it was working on what were the status of some registers some important registers etc it will store in a specific piece of memory okay go to the isr do the functions there and it will again retrieve those pieces of data from the memory and then start executing again that is again you go back open the book where your bookmark was placed and continue your normal operation now where can interrupts be used i just the uh, these are some kind of interrupts that are there in the 8051 we will come to these this is a basic representation of the sorry uh, these are just a general classification okay how interrupts can occur uh, you can classify them into either hardware or software interrupts okay the control alt del would be a kind of a software interrupt the reset can be a kind of hardware interrupt okay because it directly deals with the hardware okay control alt del the interrupt occurs because of windows okay it's not a hardware interrupt okay and in uh, if you have seen 8086 or 8085 uh, in fact in modern day processors also there's a divide by zero interrupt what is divide by zero in mathematics basically it's undefined okay so even your cpu doesn't know what it is okay so that is also capable of generating an interrupt okay and it also divided into two categories called maskable and non maskable okay maskable means you can keep it disabled okay even if the interrupt occurs nothing will happen okay and non maskable means i can't disable it your reset is an example of non maskable interrupt whatever happens if you press the reset the computer will reboot okay the controller will restart so these are basic classification of interrupts and this is what occurs just what we talked about okay 
the program is getting executed. Uh, interrupt occurs, there is an ISR which is being serviced, <laughs> things are stored, ok. The things stored are called as a context, ok. I will be saving the context, the CPU will be saving the context and while coming back it will retrieve the context. <laughs> Huh? Yeah, it is in a stack, it is in a piece of memory location in the RAM which I called as a stack, ok. Um, the next unit that we were talking, we would be talking about is timer and counters. Just before this, we will just come back to uh, the application of interrupts, where interrupts can be used, ok. Uh, some applications can be, um, you have your car, modern day cars, they have lots of microcontrollers. Okay, latest Mercedes uh, I heard had around 60 microcontrollers. Okay, uh, they do all sort of stuff from um, looking at the temperature that the brakes are. Okay, regulating the temperature inside according to a temperature outside. Uh, injecting fuel into the engine. Okay, fuel injection. Okay, that is also microprocessor controlled nowadays. Uh, then there are um, controlling the shift between two wheel, four wheel drive, automatic transmission, lots of other. Uh, lots of other areas also it is used. Uh, power windows, okay, uh, um, uh, deployment of airbags, etc. That is also that can also be microcontroller based. So suppose you are moving in a car, okay, which has a microcontroller which is doing ten different tasks, okay, and you say ram across a tree, you dash into a tree. So ideally, what should happen is the airbag should be deployed, okay. But if the uh, microcontroller which deploys the airbag is performing some other task, it won't be able to deploy the airbag. Okay. So say the sensors which sense a crash will be connected to the interrupt. Okay. So interrupt is a asynchronous input that can occur at any time and it has a higher priority than the program that is currently running. Okay. So whenever my sensor uh, detects a collision, it will give an interrupt. Okay. And I will uh, the uh, ISR in the ISR it will be written deploy airbags. Okay, so the airbags will be deployed and the other processing that is there would be stopped basically. Okay, so the airbags will be deployed and the passenger would be safe. That can be one example of an interrupt. And there can obviously be uh, tens and millions of examples where interrupts are used today. Uh, moving on to timers and counters. Uh, just before this, we will take a look at the port 3 once again. We had 4 pins there, T0, T1, INT0 and YNT1, okay. INT0 and INT1 here are the external interrupt pins, okay. Whenever I get a high to low transition on the pins, that is whenever the voltage on the pins goes from 5 to 0, okay, I will get an interrupt. So basically the sensor that was detecting a collision would be connected to that pin. Okay, so whenever the collision is detected, an interrupt would be generated and the ISR would be executed. Um, and the T0, T1 pins that are there are used for the timer and counter uh, yeah, unit. Okay. In the timer and counter unit, it is one and the same unit, but it can basically do two different tasks. Either it can act, act as a timer or it can act as a counter. Okay. The basic fundamental here is that it has a 16 bit register, okay. Uh, 16 bits means uh, it can have a value from 0 to 2 raised to 16, right. I have 16 pieces, uh, 16 bits, each can have a value of either 0 or 1, okay. So, the maximum value that can be there in the 16 bits is 2 raised to 16, Minus two. Huh, 2 raised uh, to 16, the max. Uh, the, ha, the contents can be 2 raised to 16, but since we are starting from 0, we will consider 0 also as a state. So, the maximum value would be 2 raised to 16 minus 1, ok. So, 2 raised to 16 is 65536 and minus 1 would be 65535, ok. So, the values that can I, I can have is 0 to 65535 in the register, in a 16 bit register. So basically what a timer does, we will first see timer and then the counter unit. Timer would be counting the internal clock pulses. Now, 8051 has a peculiar thing about it. Uh, each instruction that it executes takes 12 clock cycles, okay. Each instruction to execute it takes a minimum of 12 clock cycles. 
there are the different uh, microcontrollers available today which execute an instruction even in one clock cycle okay but the 8051 slightly from an older generation okay is a bit slow and it executes an instruction for every 12 clock cycles so we have two things here one is a machine cycle and one is a instruction cycle machine cycle would be the 11.50592 megahertz that is each pulse is a machine cycle and the instruction cycle would be 12 such pulses okay 12 such cycles would be the instruction cycle so what the timer does is for every instruction cycle it increments the register by 1 okay the timer increments the register by 1 so what we can have is after 6535 into 12 machine cycles we can have the 16 bit register full okay all the zero all the bits would be one like if this is a register 16 bit register this is a 0th bit as we in digital language we always go from 0 so 0 to 15 we have 16 bits okay so whenever all the bits go 1 okay that is the 2 raised to 16 minus 1 the value is 65535 okay now when another instruction cycle happens okay so what will the timer do it can't increment by 1 now okay because the 16 bit register is a memory space it is already full okay it is something like your timer is like a bucket and a leaking tap is there okay drop by drop it falls inside the bucket and when the bucket becomes full what happens it overflows similarly the timer also overflows okay we call the uh, next state after this as an overflow okay so when the timer overflows what happens is it has a capability to generate an interrupt okay we can have an interrupt at that point of time okay so now what can we do with this what can we do with an interrupt generated by a timer we can do timed events okay we know the frequency that it is running at so we know that uh, 65535 would be attained the count would be attained after the particular period of time okay so after certain periods of time i can do particular functions okay say in a data acquisition system i want to sample at a specific rate the incoming signal at a specific rate so this the sampling frequency the sampling moment i can set by a timer yes so different so for any kind of timing operation i can use this timer okay so uh, if i now every time i wouldn't want the timer to overflow at, uh, only after 65535 okay say i want to do a particular task in 5000 counts okay so what will i do okay i can't say that a timer has to overflow at 5000 okay i can't cut the bucket okay cut the bucket at half and say okay it will overflow after this time okay so what i do is i already keep it half filled okay so what i will do is if i want me to make it overflow at say 5000 counts I will fill it with 65535 minus 5000 that would be 60535 okay so when it goes 5000 counts above and the, at the next count it will overflow okay so I get an uh, overflow at every 5000 counts okay so in this way I can control the time at which it overflows and I get an interrupt and I can do whatever I want okay now uh, the counter is has a similar uh, uh, basic working but is slightly different what happens is it does not count the internal clock pulses okay not the clock pulses generated by the uh, oscillator but it counts external events okay external events happening on the t0 and t1 pins that we have, have on P3 okay every transition from a high to low on T0 or T1 pin would increment the counter by 1 again it uses the same 16 bit register okay the all the uh, things used are the same just that the mode of working is a different okay so counter whenever say I count 65535 again the counter will overflow and I can do something say a uh, very simple example where this could be used is say uh, I have a bottle manufacturing plant or say a 
it's a Pepsi plant. Okay, say a bottle comes in, it fits the fits the cap, fills and fits the cap. I just have a sensor over here. The uh, bottle passes by. I have a receiver here. The bottle passes by, and I get a pulse here. Okay. When a, whenever the bottle passes by. Okay. So this receiver I can connect to a counter. Okay. So whenever 65,535 bottles are passed, I will say one batch is over. Or say I want a batch for 5,000 bottles. So what would I do? I would just load the value 60,535 in the beginning. And whenever 5,000 5, bottles pass, I have one batch has passed and overflow interrupt occurs. I will just say, um, say the, uh, uh, what the ISR does is it uh, closes the crate. Okay, there is a bottle, uh, there is a crate in which the bottles are packed. Okay, after 5,000 bottles come into the crate, uh, another arm or something has to come and pack the crate. So, that specific action I would write in the interrupt service routine. Okay, so in this way I can use the counter. Counter can also be used in uh, very interesting application would be a cricket match for counting the number of balls that has been bowled by the umpire. Okay, six balls. Okay, uh, say it will give a. Uh, I load the count as six sixty-five thousand five hundred and twenty-nine. Okay, so whenever sixty-five, whenever six balls pass, say it will give me a beep. Okay, in the interrupt I will write beep. Okay, so the umpire need not keep track. Okay, has six balls got an over etc. Whenever it beeps. He will say, okay, it has been, uh, the six balls are over and an over is finished. So, counter can be used for a variety of applications. Just how counters work. These are also independent units, okay. The CPU does not have anything to do with the timer counter. Only when it overflows, the CPU has to execute certain instructions which is written in the ISR, okay. So, all I need to do is when I uh, initialize a timer, I just start the timer, the timer begins counting, okay. And when it overflows, it sets an interrupt flag, an interrupt is given, and if the interrupt is masked or not masked, depending upon that, the action will be taken. This is a maskable interrupt. So, if it is masked, I would not do anything. If it is unmasked, okay, or not masked, I would go to the ISR, do whatever the routine has been written to do, and come back to the normal program. Now, we have certain modes in this timer, okay. We will see what those modes are. Basically, just a 16 bit timer is quite bland, uh, because it is such a powerful microcontroller though, it has to have more features. Three modes, okay. A 13 bit mode. Now, what does this do? Uh, as I say, it is a 16 bit register, okay. So, it is made up of two 8 bit register, you can say, okay. A TH that is the timer high register and timer low register, okay. So, in the 13 bit mode, in the TL there are only 5 bits and in the TH there are 8 bits, right. So, what happens exactly in this, what is 2 raise to 5? It is 32, right, 2 raise to 5 is 32. So, in the 5 bits I can have up to 32, 32 stage basically. Uh, so, what in this what happens is it is a kind of a prescaled timer, okay, prescaled by 32. Now, what I mean by prescale is I am dividing the timing frequency by a particular number, okay. So, in this the 8 bits of TH that are there, okay, one would be incremented only after 32 counts, okay. Once the 5 bits of TL have overflowed, only then one would be incremented here, okay. So, basically I can say that the frequency has been divided by 32, that is for every 32 instruction cycles only I get one count, yes, okay. So, basically I get a slower timer, okay. I can use this for more, uh, more amount of timing application which needs a slower timer, okay. Uh, then we have the normal 16 bit mode that we were all all the time discussing, okay. And the normal 16 bit mode, there is a catch. Uh, it will not uh, say you need to count 5000 every time, okay. But after the overflow, again it will start counting from 0, okay. But we do not want that to happen, right. 
So what we would have needed to do in the 16 bit mode was in the interrupt service routine we will again the first instruction itself I will write load the counter with 60,535 okay. So I will prevent that but say suppose I want to do this automatically. So for that I have a 8 bit auto reload mode okay but the limitation is it is only a 8 bit timer it is not a complete 16 bit. So what happens is the TH is your actual timer which increments at every instruction cycle and the TL holds the load value okay. So 2 raised to 8 is 256 that is I can have a maximum of 0 to 255 okay. Suppose I need say uh, a timer overflow at every 100 counts okay every 100 counts. So what I would be doing is I would be loading 155 in the TL okay and in the start I will be loading 150 and TH also once it goes to 255 it will overflow go into the ISR do what it is supposed to do and TL will automatically load the 155 to TH. So next time it will automatically start incrementing from that particular location okay that particular number it need not start again from 0 okay so that is the advantage of auto reload mode. we had a question what watchdog timers were okay till that then we are clear that is the basic functionality and the inter, inter uh, sub, the peripheral part of the microcontroller we will be using them and when we use them the applications would get more clearer okay that is clear for everyone any doubts with that the basic part okay uh, so this is a watchdog timer uh, which one it will automatically come to zero that is a uh, property of the hardware itself. Once it overflows, it comes to zero. Yes, it is incremented once. Yeah, incremented once. In the 16 bit, what happens? After 12 instruction cycles. In this, in the 13 bit, what will happen is first the 5 bit register would be incremented. That would be incrementing at every 12 clock cycles. But only when all the 5 bits in this have gone uh, 1 that is 32 okay 2 raised to 5 32 ho jata at that time this would increment okay so basically 12 into 32 clock cycles after 12 into 32 clock cycles only 1 bit would increment in the actual timer okay watch up timer um, how often have we come across that we are running some application and our PC hangs okay we are running say uh, an mp3 or uh, uh, some, some simulation software etc 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 and suddenly our windows which is very uh, famous for certain things hangs okay. So to get out of such a condition what is basically a hang condition maybe it is executing in it is the processor is stuck in some infinite loop say doing a particular task again and again it is unable to come out of that loop okay that can be a cause of a hang okay. So how to come out of that condition so for that purpose we can use this watchdog timer what this timer is it is a normal timer okay it is uh, separate from these two timers okay they are independent and this is independent it is also a 16 bit register okay so what happens is when this overflows it has only a single ISR okay that it will reset the microcontroller okay it does you can't specify anything else in its ISR it will always reset the microcontroller if it overflows okay. So now our motive in our program should be we have to stop it from resetting at some point of time otherwise if I just keep the watchdog timer enabled it will keep on resetting my microcontroller at 65,535 okay I do not want that to happen but how does this say from a hang condition. See suppose my microcontroller goes into an infinite loop somewhere it is unable to come out of it okay so I need to manually reset it but if I have enabled the watchdog timer since it is always resetting at 65,535 it, it is obvious that it will come out of the loop at one point of the time right because watchdog timer is a independent unit okay it is not again dependent on the CPU so whenever it overflows it will come back that is it will reset and it will start again okay. 
So in my program, what I would do is, say I will reset the, I will give a condition at every particular instant, say at 60,000 counts to reset the watchdog timer. Okay, not reset the microcontroller, but reset the watchdog timer. So it goes back to zero and starts counting. Okay, but suppose it goes into an infinite loop, okay, where this particular instruction is not able to execute. There is a execu uh, the instruction of, uh, sorry, the execution of reset watchdog timer ex uh, instruction is not executed. Okay, so the watchdog timer will overflow since it is not getting reset. After it will overflow and it will reset the microcontroller instead. Okay, so what will happen is your program starts executing normally from the starting again. This is the basic function of a watchdog timer. So it can be summed up as you have to reset the watchdog timer to prevent your microcontroller from getting reset. Okay, but this is a very handy tool used uh, generally in lot of real time applications uh, where microcontrollers are used uh, to prevent it from going into some uh, hang condition. Say for an ECG or something is also running on a microcontroller, uh, maybe a more powerful microcontroller, but if suppose that goes into a hang condition, it is a fatal thing. Okay, it might affect the person attached to it very um, badly. Okay, so for that purpose, a watchdog timer can be used. Say it will save it from going into a hang condition or a lock condition. Okay. Uh, so this is a basic session uh, that we had on microcontrollers. Okay. Uh, I'll just touch up some parts on programming as in why we would use C, what are the advantages, disadvantages, how we will go about the programming part. Okay, uh, there were basic uh, syntaxes in C like if loop, while loop, for loop, initialization of variables, okay, very basic things. That's what we would be needing in the, for the coming uh, practical sessions, okay, very basic stuff see a lot of robot pictures out there because just we are into robotics so we usually have such pictures on our slides okay um, so you know about the basic hardware okay the microcontroller that we are going to use okay but all the intelligence you have a brain now but it is not yet taught okay you would say you have a very uh, it's not fertile you know it doesn't have any knowledge it doesn't have any learning capability or uh, it doesn't know what to do Okay, it's not unchannelized. The channelizing would be done by our program. What we would be writing into the microcontroller. Okay, so all the uh, functionalities only you can harness with the program. Okay, so that's what we'll just touch upon in this specific uh, presentation. We have two options to program a microcontroller, either assembly or C. Uh, what is assembly language? It is a very, very, very low level language. It's directly the language of the microcontroller. Okay. That is the language of zeros and ones. Okay. So in that you have different, different instructions, say, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 would be one instruction. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 would be another instruction. Things like that. Okay. This is a very low level or a hardware level programming. Okay. The pros of this would be, you are directly communicating with the hardware, that is you are directly, uh, you know, harnessing the entire power of the hardware. So you can write very efficient codes, faster codes and smaller codes because you are directly saying put this into this register, access this or something like that. Okay. But the cons would be, it's cumbersome to write. Okay. It's difficult to write. Uh, it's difficult to debug. Okay, you can't easily uh, say where it has gone wrong. Even if a small instruction goes wrong, you it, it is tough to find out that it does. There is a mistake at this particular place. For each processor that you begin to learn, okay, or each microcontroller that you learn, the assembly language instruction set is different. Okay, so it's not cross-platform. An assembly language for a PIC microcontroller would be different for an 8051 would be different, for an Atmel AVR would be different, for an ARM would be different. Okay. So for any time you migrate to a different microcontroller, you need to learn the assembly language. Okay. But on the other hand, we have C. Okay. It is cross-platform. Okay. There are C compilers available for all the microcontrollers almost. 
okay it is easy to write okay very english like something like uh, if this sensor detects okay do this okay it's very english like language see it's very logical to use okay in this it's where something like even if you want to write if sensor detects do this you need to write uh, 10000000 One zero 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 one zero 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 something. It's a very cumbersome language to write. Okay, you do have mnemonics for this also, but it's still a cumbersome process. So in C, it's very logical, and it is easy to debug. Okay, and another thing is it is uh, whenever another person sees your code, he finds it readable too. Okay. he doesn't need to know exactly what you have uh, what you plan to write but seeing that he can understand the code more easily okay and c is not a very high level language and neither a low level language it is a mid level language okay high level language has a lots of abstractions but c can directly communicate in bits and bytes also okay so it you could say it has the best features of assembly language as well as high level languages okay and c being around for a lot of time okay it also has a very wide support available for it even if you have you are stuck up somewhere you could just google it up and you would get lots of resources on it where you are stuck up why you are stuck up this might be the mistake etc etc okay and c is cross platform used on c on linux windows etc etc and for each microcontroller as i said a compiler is available okay so we for our purposes would be using c okay some features of c a uh, mid level language long history easy logical syntax etc etc so would be whatever we discuss just a summary of those programming here uh, we will use a compiler uh, we might use uh, we actually plan to use a compiler called keel but we'll be using a compiler called sdcc okay um this sdcc is just generally a command line compiler it's a free open source compiler available but it's a command line compiler okay so it's slightly difficult to use but we have just modified it a bit we have developed a gui for it at our own place so it would be uh, it would have all the you could say again a balance of all the features between a commercial compiler like keel and a open source compiler like sdcc okay so we'll be using a compiler which is Developed. It's called TRIC. It will you will see it when you use it. Okay, very easy to use interface. A graphical user interface. Uh, not even like Turbo CC. It would be more like a Visual C or something. Uh, you can create uh, C files, add uh, multiple C files to projects. Okay, not necessarily that you add only one C file. You have generally header files for everything. Okay, so many different features. A very easy to use uh, IDE. This is a basic process of how we go about programming a microcontroller. The actual process, okay. For so what do we do is first we write a program in C. Okay. Now the machine it doesn't understand C. It understands only zeros and ones. So it needs to be converted into a assembly language file. Okay. And now since I am working on a PC and writing a program for a microcontroller, I won't be using a compiler. I will be using something called as cross compiler. Okay. Generally, Turbo C, Visual C, Borland C, etc., etc., are compilers because this code I would be writing in them would be executed on the PC itself. Okay, but in this, I am writing it on one platform that is on the PC, but executing it on the 8051 microcontroller. Okay, so it is called a cross compiler. Okay, so I compile it into assembly. Okay, then convert it into a hex format. The hex format is the actual format that is the zeros and ones, and then I burn it into the microcontroller the process of writing into the flash is called burning okay like we burn a cd we also burn data into flash okay there are two types in which we can program okay uh, one is by a hardware programmer and one is by a software programmer in system programming as it is written means uh, you don't need to take the microcontroller out of your system and program the chip separately okay using a separate hardware you keep your microcontroller as it is on the system and just insert a cable from the pc and program it uh, generally you would see in labs etc there are programmer kits available 
which you physically have to take the microcontroller off from your actual board, wherever you are using it, put it into a burner, it will burn it and again insert it. Okay. In system program, the programmer saves this number of steps. It is easier for rapid product development and it is a faster way. Okay. So, uh, and this bootloader, one of the reasons why we choose Philips 89V5 and RD2 makes the in-system programming, uh, in -system programming a very easy task. Okay. Now, what the bootloader is, uh, this you can see is a uh, flash programmer, a hardware based programmer. Okay. You take the chip out, put it into a programmer, burn it. And what we will be having here is a bootloader. The bootloader software, okay, it is a very small piece of code around 1 KB in size, is at the particular place in a memory location. What happens um, when you start the microcontroller? Okay. When you start the microcontroller, the bootloader checks whether some whether an external PC is trying to program it. Okay. It checks the RXD, TXD pin. The microcontroller uses the UART for programming itself also. Okay. That is another function for which the microcontroller uses the UART. Okay. So, when the microcontroller is switched on, first it checks for 400 milliseconds or so whether someone is trying to program it. Okay. If it is, if someone is trying to program it, the, that is a PC, the PC actually sends a particular string of data. Okay. And if this data matches with the programming sequence, then it begins programming or else if for a particular period, no one, is, the string is not matching, it will start executing the code which was there in the microcontroller before. Okay. The bootloader you can say is something like the BIOS you have in the PC okay, for starting up. BIOS is PC. Uh, like uh, even if you have not loaded windows or anything, it, the PC will still boot okay, and say ask for something to put uh, as in it will ask for say install install CD or something else. Okay. So, this bootloader section will check if something is trying to program it. If it is programming, it will take it from uh, the PC and start writing it into the flash. Okay. So, this makes our task very easier. Okay. In system programming generally makes tasks very easy. Okay. So, basically the bootloader is used for initialization you could say and that is a uh, major reason why we use the 89V51 RD2 otherwise uh, 8051s there are lots and lots of different variants of 8051s available but this is a uh, added feature in this 89V51 RD2. Uh, this tool flash magic okay, this is a tool that will help us in programming the microcontroller. Okay. You can see the various settings over there like which COM port to select, what would be the baud rate, you can see 9600 written. Okay. Uh, then there is the device select, this uh, flash magic can program lots of devices. We will select our device that is 89V51 RD2. Then there is a section where you enter the file, you can see a browse uh, button also. Okay. There are various other options for erasing the entire flash, for checking whether the program has been written completely and correctly or not. What it does is it writes the program it again reads back and compares it with the file on the computer and say ok it is verified the program is written correctly ok something like that. So, this is a software interface that we would be using. Uh, it is uh, available on flashmagictool.com we would be giving you a CD ok in that uh, there would be everything from the compiler that we would be using some sample programs more about the kids that we would be using and the flash magic also. Okay. So, so, it would be a quite a. So, this bootloader? Which? This yeah. Bootloader. This, uh, this can be used with many hardware burners also, but when it, uh, when we select the device as 89V51 RD2, what it will do is, it would uh, send in the uh, programming sequence first. Okay. Whenever I press start here, and if my uh, microcontroller is on, it will send the sequence. Yes, it will send the sequence. The microcontroller bootloader will check whether the sequence is the one which is needed for programming. Okay, and if it's matching, the bootloader will send another data. Okay, S start sending me the program. I will write the flash, something like that. Okay, um, that's it for this session.